supposed to do that automatically. All right, broadcasting now. Good afternoon, welcome to the current edition of 4-4. This afternoon we have with us Tanakia Word, Latoya Hobbs, and Jennifer Mack Watkins, all printmakers who do extraordinary work in their fields and are doing their best to expand that field, particularly as it relates to the representation of Black women printmakers. Um, I am going to take some time and just talk about what 4-4 is and what it's meant to be. Um, part of what my impetus in creating the series is is just thinking about looking around everybody's doing zooms everybody's like on ig live every five seconds um and so i was looking around at who i was not seeing who i was not hearing from in the context of all the conversations that are being had right now um so i realized i wasn't seeing black women and i wanted expressly to see black women so um here we are, 4-4. Four, four. Um, so each week, those of you who are new, um, wow, we're already at 70. We have, uh, we had a, last time I looked, we had 165 um, registrants, which is actually more than we've ever had before. So I'm very excited. So sadly, that means quite a few people are not gonna get in, but it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be great. They'll watch later. <laughs> um, also, uh, just a few things. I love to have an active chat so you guys can put whatever questions you may have or thoughts you may have in the chat. Also, we do have usually Q&A at the end. So if you want to place your questions there, um, that would be incredible. Also, um, also screenshots. I love screenshots. So please tag each of us if you take screenshots with your phone or um, with your actual computer or whatever device you're joining us with. Um, so again, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate the support from week to week. You guys are really blowing my mind. Cause as I said, I created this, you know, to present the voices of others. It's not about me. It's not about what I think. Um, so I'm really grateful to have this continued outpouring of support each week. Um, so we're going to get started. Typically how this works is I introduce each person who will be joining us today. Um, again, usually that's three people in addition to myself, hence the number four. Um, so today we have Latoya Hobbs, again, Jennifer Mack Watkins, and Tanakia Word. Again, all printmakers, all founding members of Black Women of Print. So we're super excited to have them. And I'm going to begin by introducing Latoya. Latoya Hobbs' work deals with figurative imagery that addresses the ideas of beauty, cultural identity, and womanhood as they relate to women of the African diaspora. She creates a fluid and symbiotic relationship between her printmaking and paint practice, producing works that are marked by texture, color, and bold patterns. In 2019, Latoya received an Individual Artist Award from the Maryland State Arts Council, as well as an Artist Travel Grant awarded by the Municipal Art Society of Baltimore. She is a 2020 recipient of the Artist in Residence Award at the Joan Mitchell Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. Latoya devotes her time to teaching and inspiring young artists as a professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art and she's a founding member of Black Women of Print, a collective whose vision is to make visible the narratives and works of Black women printmakers, past, present, and future. Thank you so much, Latoya, for joining us this afternoon. And feel free to share with us your thoughts and reflections about your inspirations, about your work, etc. Hi. Uh, so. Thank you so much, everyone who's joining us today. Uh, thank you to our gracious host for number one, putting this together. Um, I've been listening to the past few sessions and it's always a joy to hear other women speak about their practices in particular. Um, so for my talk today, I put together um, just a PowerPoint. So I'm gonna be talking about first my art influences. Um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about process with printmaking, because I feel like a lot of times people don't necessarily understand fully what printmaking is. And then I'm gonna share a couple images um, from some bodies of work. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Okay. 
Okay. All right, so I'm going to start off just by talking about a few of my influences. Um, all time number one influence on my practice as an artist is Elizabeth Catlett. For those of you who are not familiar with her, she is a printmaker and sculptor, um, really inspired by not only just the technical quality of her work and the beauty of her work, but also um, the way in which she displays and empowers Black women. Um, another early influence of mine was Eliezer Couture, again, really drawn to the way that he depicted women in his work. Um, Berkeley L. Hendricks, um, just, a, you know, he was one of the first um, artists that I saw um, on my first trip to New York at the Studio Museum in Harlem. So I was just really taken aback by the power of his figures um, and his focus on the Black figure. Um, also, Micheline Thomas is a favorite artist of mine just because of her materiality and the way she experiments with materials. Um, same thing with Angedeca Crosby. Um, I really enjoy just the seamless the way that she's able to bring all these different elements together in her work and also inspired by the way she utilizes space. And then Carrie James Marshall. Um, I mean, what is not to, they're not to say about Carrie James Marshall. Um, he kind of really just em embodies all the things that I aspire to in terms of how he um, sees himself in the art world and also just how he talks about his practice. Okay, so I'm going to take a few slides just to try to talk about process. Um, so within my printmaking practice, I primarily focus on a relief, or we can also call that woodcut. Um, but when I go to shows, I tend to find that people are not necessarily um, well versed in what printmaking actually is. So I'm just going to show a few images. So this um, image shows uh, my matrix. And so anytime you have a printmaking process, there's always some type of matrix that you're going to be using. So with woodcut, our matrix is, again, a, a piece of wood. Um, and also on this screen, you can see my wood carving tools here. Like um, these are gouges that I use to actually carve into the surface of the block. Um, so I start with the drawing and then I do my carving to kind of bring the image to the surface. Um, and so for me, the theory behind like printmaking also is that I feel like every time that I'm cutting away a block or cutting away to bring an image, it's, it's symbolic of cutting away negativity or things that are imposed on us by outside forces to really embrace and expose our true selves. So after I go through a series of drawing and cutting and drawing and cutting, then the next thing we have is the proofing process. So you basically uh, take a large roller and you roll ink over the surface and it helps you to see the image a lot more clearly. And then you can go back and revise things and make mistakes. Um, and one thing that is particular, particularly important with woodcut, um, when I tell my students is when in doubt, don't cut it out because you really can't go back. So you have to be really sure about the image that you're making. So after the proofing stage is done, then the block is transferred to a large printing press. Um, the beautiful thing about printmaking is that with relief printmaking is that if you don't have a press, you can just, you know, do hand printing, which, which was what I do in my studio at home. Um, but in this image, we see the block is transferred uh, to a large printing press. And then once you put a piece of paper on top of it, the pressure from the press transfers the ink to the page, and then you have your final print. So this is just kind of a snapshot um, of the printmaking process for those who may not be familiar. Okay, so now I'm going to show some of my early works uh, from my you know, when I first started um, engaging in the practice of printmaking. Um, so we can see here, these are a little bit smaller in image in size, about 11 by 14. So I was just really trying to understand the process of printmaking, uh, which I really didn't like at first. Um, I was a painting major in undergrad and I was like, printmaking, what's that? Um, but then when I was exposed to Elizabeth Catlett's work, it kind of showed me the possibilities of what could be done with that medium. And I started to take it um, a lot more seriously. Uh, so here are a couple of more early images. Um, then we have like some color processes. So on the, the image on the left here is a reduction block. And then the image on the right is a six colored block. So you basically have each of the different colors that you see in that print is a different block that was carved and then coordinated and put together to create the final image. And then we jumped to around 2010 is when I started graduate school. So I decided to um, study printmaking for my MFA at Purdue University. Um, so one of the things that I noticed in the, in the work is that there's a drastic increase in scale. So before the images were around like 11 by 14 or um, maybe 22 by 30, but then we jumped to kind of working on a larger scale. And for me, that, that jump in scale was kind of a reflection of um, the women that I was reflecting through my work, just kind of showing like their importance and their stature uh, to me. 
Okay, so the next few images I'm going to show are uh, from a series that I worked on primarily during um, graduate school called Beautiful Uprising. And I was particularly um, exploring um, internalized racism and also just kind of this idea of rejecting Eurocentric standards of beauty. Um, and so I looked at that through the lens of three areas, primarily our hair texture, skin complexion, and our body image, because um, I felt that those were kind of the three areas that I saw kind of coming up over and over again in my research. Uh, so this image here is called Transition Double Self Portrait, um, and it's really inspired by my um, experiences of going natural or doing the big chop. Um, so prior, when I had straight hair, I just, you know, noticed that there was a difference when I decided to go natural in terms of how people were treated or reacted to me. Um, and what I found most interesting was that a lot of the negativity that I got was from other Black women or other Black people. Um, so that was kind of a like intriguing thing to me and I wanted to research that and understand like why that negativity uh, came, where that negativity came from. Um, so I'm just going to breeze through some of these images. Um, so after that experience, I really decided in my work that I wanted to focus on uh, highlighting uh, black women with natural hair just to kind of give a different perspective of what is considered beautiful. So I'm going to quickly go through some of these images just for sake of time. I call this like my Vidal Sassoon piece, um, just because, you know, it always reminded me of like when you see the hair commercials and like you just women like happily swinging their hair in the wind. So <laughs> I wanted to have a version of that, but a black woman with locks doing that same carefreeness. Another thing that is important to my work is that I use symbols a lot and um, primarily I take get inspiration from these patterns and symbols from everywhere, but a lot of them are Adinkra symbols. Um, so I was kind of first exposed to those in around 2010 by one of my friends who had a um, natural hair collective and their symbol was a dewafe, which is the wooden pick. Um, and when she told me what it meant, I felt it that symbol in particular really reflected a lot of what I was trying to say in my work. So um, I started you know, studying that, uh, those symbols and kind of incorporating them into my work, not only um, for aesthetic purposes, just because I feel like it added something uh, to my portraiture that was kind of lacking, um, but I also like the, that for me it represents the link between being connected with your culture and your sense of identity. So here are a couple more images from those. And then this installation represents uh, me just kind of uh, working through colorism. Um, so I was kind of exploring that at the time through this series. So this project is um, screen printed paper bags and it's kind of my commentary on the brown paper bag test. Um, so just kind of really looking at within our own community, the ways that, you know, internalized racism affects us. So what I did with this project is that I just kind of made note of how black people describe their skin, women in particular. So I would read a lot of hair and beauty blogs and just write down what people would say and also just kind of thought about um, how I describe my own skin or how people in my community describe my, my skin as well. So. Here's an example of, of a couple of the phrases, but there's also like red bone, high yellow, um, dark mocha chocolate. So, um, but I really wanted to bring to light just kind of how the absurdity of that practice historically, but also how um, traces of that are still present today. Um, and again, a lot of that is inspired, inspired by my own experiences and just things that I would hear people say in my community. Okay, and then these next images just kind of uh, talk about body image a little bit. Um, so I wanted to do a series of nudes um, in celebration of the black female body because in a lot of my research, um, you know, I would say like Google like black female nudes and everything, nothing was associated with art or beauty or majesty, but everything was pretty much associated with like porn or something negative. So um, I wanted to just explore that and to show a different perspective. Um, another thing with these pieces is that um, just thinking about the gaze and how in the past black female bodies have been objectified and I'm thinking about my role as the artist and what that means for me. Um, so in these pieces in particular, I took time to interview the models for the work. 
Um, because a lot of times we always hear the voice of the artist and then we also hear the voice of the viewer who's responding to the work, but not a lot of times we hear the voice of the subject of the painting. And that's something that I wanted to change um, that narrative in my piece. So I interviewed all of the women and just got them to write about their feelings about being a black woman, about their identity, their sense of beauty, what that means to them. And also just the idea of someone like replicating their image in the form of art. Um, and so uh, this is an excerpt of the text that this model wrote about herself, I won't take the time to read through the whole thing. Um, but if you look at closely at the piece, I use the words as the backdrop or the foundation of the work so that I'm not just representing the figures like in body, but also in mind and spirit as well. Um, and then I also took excerpts from the text and use that to, um, to for as titles of the work as well. So the title of this piece is My Fears Dis Disintegrated Into Nothing. Here's another uh, piece in that series. Um, the title of this is My Hair Was the Least of My Worries. This piece is called Everyone is Still Shocked, Impressed Too. Um, and, and then this last piece is called What Audacity I Must Have. And another thing that is special for me about these pieces um, is that they represent the first time where I really was trying to marry my printmaking and painting practices together. Because um, I was really trying to find a way to kind of um, extend the, the contemporary conversations about figurative work and deciding like what that meant to me and doing it in a way that I felt was like natural and authentic. Um, so I started to bring everything I did into the same surface. So this was around like 2012. And that's also what I'm kind of focusing on now, which you'll see in some of these other images. Okay, um, I threw in a couple of monotypes just to show uh, another type of printmaking practice that I engage in. So I have a couple of those. And I'm going to move a little bit fast because I know other people have to present. Uh, so now I just want to show a couple of um, gallery images. So these are from my first solo museum exhibition at the African American Museum in Dallas. Um, and I like, wanted to throw these in just to kind of give you uh, a little bit of context in terms of the scale. Because um, with woodcut and relief, generally um, images are pretty small in size. So I wanted to kind of uh, push the envelope and just kind of explore uh, printmaking on a larger scale. So here are more images of the work in the space. Here's another image. This is a, from a solo exhibition that I had at Goucher College here in Maryland. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the work that I'm doing now. Um, so I'm engaging in a series that's titled Salt of the Earth. Um, so I initially had the idea for this series in graduate school around like 2012, 2013. And I just we kept hearing like in my mind and in my spirit, salt of the earth, that's going to be the name of your next series. And I really didn't um, know what that was going to mean. I just knew that I was going to, whatever the series was, it was going to be titled that and I was going to be exploring that. If you aren't familiar with that phrase, it, it's inspired by um, the scripture, Matthew 5, 13. It's basically saying you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, what well, shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. So in this particular context, I am personifying Black women as salt. Like Black women are the salt of the earth. And so for me, I am uh, thinking about that in terms of how we are preservers of our family and culture and community. Um, and so earlier I talked about, I knew I wanted to do this series, but I really wasn't sure what it meant. But when I um, made the, my ascent into motherhood. I, I'm the mother of two boys who are three and five. Um, it really became clear uh, to me what this series meant. So in addition to thinking about women as preservers, I'm also thinking about this idea of the matriarch and how that idea has transformed over time. Um, I'm also thinking about this, this idea of preserving as Black women, as we're preserving and um, keeping everybody else together. At the same time, what are we doing to preserve ourselves? And what does that look like when we don't preserve ourselves? What does it look like when the salt has been cast out? Um, just And then for me, it just thinks about being a mother. It thinks about, I think about like um, the superwoman complex that we tend to have. Like we feel like we have to champion everything and be everything for everybody. And a lot of times we neglect ourselves in that process. Um, I'm thinking about lineage, about you know, my mom, uh, the women in my family, the women that I grew up with, my cousins, um, we are all mothers now. And what does that, that lineage and that tradition, what are the tra traditions that we're passing on to our children? So I'm kind of exploring all of those things within this series. So here are a couple images. Um, this 
piece is titled Birth of a Mother. And you can see in this work, I'm kind of, again, still thinking about marrying uh, my printmaking and painting practices together as much as possible. So in the background, um, you can see like the stenciling, which is a form of printmaking. Um, the chair is painted, the floor is painted, the flesh of my figure is painted, but the dress is done like a woodcut. Um, I still do um, more traditional prints as well. This is uh, another print, a woodcut. Um, and so the vein that I'm in now is, you know, even though I'm still engaging in traditional printmaking practices, I'm really trying to think about um, how I can broaden things as much as possible. So with these works, they're part of the same series. Um, I call them kind of like two for one <laughs> pieces. So uh, with this image on the left here, this is like a woodcut block, a panel that I carved with the intention of it being printed. So I have a small addition on, and the image of the right represents like the addition of the piece. So there's like three, an addition of three. But when I present the work, I present the one with the gold background. For me, I consider that a painting, even though it started out as um, a block that was gonna be prepared to make a woodcut. So I have a series of those and you can kind of see um, the images juxtaposed against each other. Again, the painting is on the left and then the print on the right. A few more images. And then here, I just wanted to show a gallery shot um, of the, the, the blocks, like when I was preparing to print them in my studio. Um, so I think sometimes when people see the images online, they're not sure, like, is it a print or is it a painting? Um, but there's like a version of both of them. And I also like that as well. I like the fact that, um, you know, I'm putting all these processes together and it's a challenge for me to bring all these techniques together, but then have them like done seamlessly on the same surface. So that's something that I just personally enjoy about these works. Um, so these are more recent images uh, from last year. Um, I don't know, this is a really special piece for me. I don't know, there's something special about the, this work. <laughs> um, so again, you can see this, the carving, there's painting, there's collage, kind of all happening together on the same surface. And you know, this also arose just because um, when I would do my woodcuts, I would find that I would become more attached to the block than the actual print. Like while I'm, I was spending so much time carving the block and I'm, I'm really drawn to texture. Um, so I would be so excited about the block. And then when I would print the print, I was like, oh, okay, the print's nice, but look at this block though. Um, and then I also would have people who, you know, who would see me working and they would want to know like, can I purchase the block? And I'm like, well, that's not something that you're supposed to purchase. It's a part of the, you know, the practice. Um, and so for me, I was just like, well, why not just, you know, do everything all on one surface? So here's another image in this series. And so I have the full image over here, but then I also wanted to show kind of a close up uh, so you can kind of see the carving um, on the surface of the panel. Another image. And then this is um, one of the newest pieces that I've done. Uh, the title of this is um, How Janetta Taught Us to Pray, and Janetta is my grandmother. Um, so in with me kind of exploring this idea of the matriarch, I'm really starting to look to my family for inspiration and thinking about the, the traditions that have been passed down. Um, and so I used to talk with my mom about my grandmother. And one day I was saying how she, when I would stay there in the summertime, she would wake me and my cousins up at like three o'clock in the morning and we, she would line us up in the living room and then we would all have to pray and uh, say a scripture from the Bible. And then my mom was like, girl, she made us do that too. <laughs> uh, so just thinking about this uh, idea of prayer and how that's been a kind of a running thing uh, in my family. So this is a tribute to my grandma, but um, the image is actually a portrait of my mother. Um, this is a, a diptych. So this is the second piece to that, is, which is a portrait of myself. Um, and again, just thinking about this idea of the matriarch and what traditions were passing down. Um, and here's a close up of those images. And then this is how the pieces will look together. I still have a few things that I'm working out in terms of like finishing touches, but um, that's generally how the pieces will look together. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you guys. I'm gonna stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Latoya. That was really incredible. And to see uh, just your thought process elucidated so well was really great. 
Um, so next we have Jennifer Mack Watkins. Jennifer Mack Watkins holds an undergraduate degree in studio arts from Morris Brown College, a master's degree in art education from Tufts University, and an MFA in printmaking from Pratt Institute. She has exhibited in several galleries and museums, including Brooklyn Museum, Newark Museum, the International Print Center in New York, and Mason Murrer Gallery in Georgia. She's the recipient of the Elizabeth Catlett Printmaking Award from Hampton University Museum. Her work is in the permanent collections of Agnes Scott College, the Newark Public Library, and Clark Atlanta University. Her work has been recognized by the Mohuhanga Innovation Lab and Joan Mitchell Foundation. In 2019, Jennifer contributed work with writer Fayemi Shakur and wrote, worked collaboratively with 15 Newark-based female-identified writers, poets, and visual artists to create an art book entitled A Womb of Violet, an anthology, a collection of poetry and original prints along with 15, yeah, we said that already. Jennifer also collaborated with the collective she's a member of, Black Women in Print, which we'll sure hear more about, to produce the print portfolio titled Continuum. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for being here with us this afternoon. I'm super excited to hear from you. And yeah. feel free to take it away. Okay, yeah, all right. So I wanted to start off by sharing my screen. But before I, before I do that, I want to say thank you for everybody for joining us here today. I'm going to share my screen. I've prepared with you. A, a little PowerPoint, um, and it should go pretty, hopefully, yeah, hopefully it will go pretty well. All right, so the first image that you're about to see uh, is a picture of me carving. So what's interesting about Japanese woodblock are also called makuhanga, uh, which I'm currently doing because I'm in my apartment and um, it works well for me as a mom. You have to, I have to try to make sure I carve differently from what I was trained. Um, when I carve, I try to make sure that I, I take away everything. So basically I'm using less texture, but recently I've, I've been able to been able to do both of them, both in, um, in my work. Um, I want to start off with this image first because this is my first exhibition, solo exhibition that I've had recently, um, right before I had my son. This took place in um, November of 2019 and it, and it lasted until about December. And I wanted to make this show very special because for me as a printmaker, it's really important to make sure that I'm educating um, the people, my audience, um, families, children, students, people who might be inspired artists to see how um, important printmaking is to me. And so I, one of those ways that I do that is making sure my work is representing the best part of who I am as a printmaker. And also I like to um, combine demonstrations right on the spot. Um, so you can see here at the closing of the show, I got a chance to demonstrate um, the technique of makohanga right in front of the audience. Um, and so you can see here, I, I also do demonstrations and workshops in the community. So on the far left, it's um, a picture that I did with Rutgers University in, in, in Newark. And I did it a couple summers back, 2016, when I was birthing my daughter. I always seem to, um, to have solo shows or, or workshops when I'm birthing. Um, and so like then here on, this, on, this, on the right side, it's a picture of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And that was really interesting because like I said before, like I, I really feel like it's important to educate and let people know that there are Black women printmakers out there. There are practicing Black artists. And so one way to do that is to interrupt space. And so I interrupted space that day um, to celebrate children's work, Children's Day, and they had a workshop. And it was the first time I got a chance to just be an artist in resident at the, at the museum. And I had a chance to work on a project where I had a chance to, uh, I guess, work for months. I had to think about the supplies and I think about like how would the families travel from table to table because I wasn't teaching everybody about like how to do it. I carved the blocks and the educators at the museum got a chance to have the community print my own blocks and so I just my main focus that day was just to demonstrate and I demonstrated for about about four or five hours um, and this is my most current work. My most current work basically I'm a teacher. I teach teach art at a, a private school in New Jersey. And um, I think about like how we have to keep adapting as, as educators, how we have to keep adapting our lives. And so um, this is called Duck and Cover, which I created in 2019. I continue to take workshops um, just to better myself and just to continue to learn this new art form. I started learning about 2012, 
um, from a teacher named April Balmer, and then um, at the Lower East Side Print Shop. And then also um, I've learned with Takuti Hamanaka, and I, I learned from him at Manhattan Graphics. And so I trained in printmaking, but I, I didn't know anything about Japanese woodblock and the difference between um, like printing woodcuts and Japanese woodblock is that you have to have paper that is wet and you're working with watercolor, you're working with gouaches, you're working with pigments that have to be watered down and you, you're working with wood, you're working with carving. And so all those elements make up what, what you see. But this print is very different because I added in a collage component and I have like a Pakashi in the background, which is like a, a quick fade. And you can see how I was experimenting with that here, but also bringing the Western carving into the tables. Um, this one is from 2019 as well. It's called Take a Look and it, it's inspired by like, I wanna make sure that, um, that, that students and just children and just people don't forget how important it is to read and just how important it is to just be okay to just be able to imagine. So I was thinking about reading Rainbow, um, Take a Look, it's in a book. So I decided to call it Take a Look, the university is yours to inspire my daughter to feel like anything and children, anybody look at it, anybody who looks at it is that they can be inspired to know that, you know, any, you can go anywhere you want to go and you can be anything you want to be. And so I was really inspired by just growing up and thinking, you know, I can, I can be anything. Um, and so like, this is also different as well because I added a collage component in the background with stars. And so this is really fitting because we've got a chance to, to see how NASA is going up and exploring again. So space is um, important and so is the sciences in this piece. Um, this is called lesson number one. And so I, I look at like a lot of vintage photographs of like, um, how like teachers are like posed, like it's okay, you know, we're just posing for our drill, you know, or we're just posing because like we're, it's an atomic bomb happening. So like I wanted to think about like drills and how those drills have continued to repeat. So I look a lot at vintage, um, vintage photographs. I research a lot, like what was a time period like to be a teacher? What was a time period like to be a student? And so um, this one is called You Are a Target. And so you can see how there's targets on the, there's targets on the, on the, on the children. And so um, then the lady is holding a gun who is a teacher and there's a bullet and the bullet shells are wrapped against her chest um, as a way for protection. And um, you can see there's a gunshot range man and it's just basically saying that, you know, like children, you are a target, you know, um, you're not safe, but my job as a teacher is to protect you. Um, but it's important to know that, you know, school is still important, but the teacher is a role of, of the protector. And so in, in my spaces that I put my woman in, you know, they have a role and that role is to be in that space, take control um, and be a protector or tell a story. I, I think that's all that I have for there. And I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll just take any, any questions. We typically do questions at the end. Um, so if you want to talk more about just your process in terms of what you're working on right now, okay. you can. All right. So I can definitely do that. Yeah, it's about three, three more minutes or so. Okay. All right, gotcha. All right, so right now I'm working on getting some images together and the images are gonna be combined with like dolls and like um, a lady that is from Vermont. I have a solo show coming up at the Brattleboro Museum in Vermont in 2020, 2020, 2021, sorry, um, next year. And so I'm just right now just making up sketches for those. And so basically Daisy Turner is gonna be the subject of, of my work. And I'm gonna combine like silk screening and woodcut together. And Daisy Turner lived to be about 104 years old and basically she told her story of how it was for her growing up as a child and overcoming racism in the 1900s. Um, her family had about 100 acres of land. Um, they lived off the land by with chickens and farmed, and um, they farmed off the land, um, but they didn't have any electricity or running water. So even though they had a lot of land, they still lived like, you know, just very minimal, but they were able to survive and, you know, keep this house, you know, in, in good tip top condition. And so, um, Basically, I'm trying to say with that is that children are very vulnerable, but they have the strength. They have, um, you know, like just the childhood to just bring them through strong situations like how we're dealing with now. And um, even though that Daisy Turner fought racism back then, we're still dealing with racism again today. And so I want to basically show how children are strong and, um, and how 
sometimes people think like, you know, oh, you know, they, they're, they look so innocent, you know, but how can they, you know, overcome these things? And so that's what we're working on next for our next project. Brilliant. Thank you. So, uh, so last but certainly not least, we have Tanakia Word off, uh, joining us. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that. I'm really sorry. Um, Tanakia Word is a visual artist, printmaker, art and culture journalist, post-secondary art educator and scholar, as well as the founder of Black Women of Print. She earned a BA in English and Afro-American Studies from Howard University, H-U, I'm sorry, I'll never not do that, I don't care where I am, um, and an MA in Arts Management in, uh, from 20, in 2011 from American University. Currently, she is an urban education dissertator with a specialization in art education, a womanist. Her work heavily focuses on black geographies. Tanakia Word sa samples the past, remixes the present, and reimagines the future of blackness through the lens of black girl, hood and womanhood. Thank you so much, Tanakia, for being hey. here and for helping me think through this process of how I was gonna do this. So I really appreciate you and spotlight on you now. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, it, I am excited to be here. I have not done this before, so I was hoping I didn't pull a Teddy Riley on <laughs> on everyone. So I'm going to actually go and share my screen so that I can give you all a gist of what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, a, th a theme within my work, which is Black geographies. We have possibly heard of Afrofuturism or womanism, but I wanted to center the work on Black geographies on today. As a scholar and also as an artist, it's kind of hard sometimes to speak to audiences so that they understand that these two things can actually be meshed together. It is possible to be a scholar and also an artist too. Um, shout out to David Driscoll for that. So I want to talk about black geography specifically. When we look at human geography or geography um, in general within academia or the discipline, it is a, a space that is considered all knowing. They call it a transparent space, right? And because it's transparent, that means that because they have geometric coordinates, that means that everything they believe theoretically is knowable. Within black geographies, we understand that all spaces are not knowable. We see systemic oppression. That could be a space that you cannot place on a coordinate, correct? Okay. So they use material representational imagery, um, imaginary and philosophical courses to shape our everyday lives. My scholarship in particularly, um, the written and visual is a counter mapping, a spatializing of counter narratives, black social and interior life. So I look at the spatialities of real live and imagine within my work. Can't see me. I don't know. I'm so sorry. I don't know why you all can't see me. There we go. Okay, sorry. So can you all see my screen and me? I'm so sorry about that. Yep, we see both. Thank you. Okay, you see both. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to show you all is a piece called Black Is, which I did in 2018 as a screen print. I go from text-based work to uh, figurative work. So within this um, piece, of, within this piece, I keep a black sheet of paper to kind of personify the black body, and I use a varnish to print the work so that once you approach the work, you're able to see all the characteristics, all the details of it. But from all the way back, you cannot see all the words, and that's 
pretty much how, when you're looking at embodied placemaking, how the black body is marked in spaces. People see blackness and they also see those stereotypes that continuously come up over and over again. But not until you get into the close proximity of a person, then you can actually see their characteristics. So I wanted the Black is piece to actually do that. And once you come approach the piece, you see that Black is beautiful. And when you end the piece, it's blank so that you can feel that in yourself, you know, as a Black person, because we are not monolithic. Moving along, I wanted to show you another piece that is text-based. This piece, this piece um, is like, a crossword puzzle. I called it in search of a word search puzzle, sorry, in search of black hair. Okay, so we see that there's all these different things that you see that are associated with black hair. Um, just for me, um, some of you may know these things, quick weave, black hair, finger waves, all the way down. So we have a list of things that you can actually go and find in here. But because I talked to you all before about black geographies and there is a known space and an unknown, a subalternate, alternate space, then when you look in here, you may see other words that are not down here. So like safe space, okay? I have safe space in there for black hair because when you're going to the salon or the barbershop, that becomes a home, a safe place um, as well. So you have to go in here and find the different words that are not listed. They are not known, but they're still there. So that shows via text the limitations of traditional Western geography. So we're gonna move on to the figurative, okay? So within the representational work, I also was inspired by text. Um, Lucille Clifton has a poem that I absolutely love, Won't You Celebrate With Me? And with this piece, I decided to um, call it Starshine and Clay. She said, both non-white woman that I see that myself, I made it up here on the bridge between Starshine and Clay. So I tried to use the arch and also kind of like a halo, but it could also be sunset or a moon. And then I wanted to do the exaggerated hair. Um, the face took on the personification of a night sky, the body, the water, and then the clothing terrain. I also broke the frame within this too to talk about minoritized spaces and marginalization and that we can break the frame as well. This is a study series that I do. This is half of the series. It's a 29 piece um, series. This is 15 of the works. I specifically looked at a Fulani um, African tribe hairstyle and I reimagined that. And I wanted to see what can I do with identity. First of all, when you see blackness, there is a stereotypical monolithic thing associated with just the identity. But I wanted to say, if I take the same singular subject and I excavate and I add to it and I expand it, I wanted to conceptually show that even with the same subject, cultural nuances exist. So this um, piece shows that. Um, I also, with womanism, have merged in nature. Um, one of the prongs of womanism that I particularly love is the combination of nature and a person becoming a spiritual being together, right? So that's one of the prongs that I use within this as well. I think that's the end of my slide there and I will stop showing. Cool. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the process through which you created Black Women of Print or? Yes, so I can talk about that. So it looks like I'm frozen, I'm not sure. Okay, so Black Women of Print, basically when I went to school um, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, I had learned printmaking before at Pyramid Atlantic in Maryland. I learned printmaking, specifically screen printing there. But then when I went on to graduate school for my doctorate, I decided to take a couple courses while I was there. And I have painted for forever, so I'm also a painter, but I wanted to get more into printmaking and near to forms because of the text-based work. When I was there, I didn't see 
any students who looked like me within the program um, whatsoever or who were taking the classes. That was also the case um, between most of my life being in the art field in general. And so I talked to one of the one of my professors who was at, who's absolutely brilliant. Her name's Jessica, and we started talking about um, the different ways in which um, blackness is in and out of the printmaking field. And I went and grabbed a big book. Um, of women printmakers. And I started reading the book, reading the book, and I only saw two names for black women printmakers. Um, and this was from like the 1800s or something, all the way until present times. And I was just like, okay. Now I knew that they, was going, they were going to have Elizabeth Catlett and Margaret T.G. Burroughs because, you know, everyone knows them and rightfully so. But I knew about way more Black women printmakers and Black women artists than that. So I wanted to create a space, a home place for Black women printmakers so that we can collectively talk together, um, share our experiences, um, methods, our praxis, and um, basically build a space so that it can be more visible for um, Black women printmakers from the past because they need their due respect as well their homage, and then also for a present. So if we start doing this now, then that means that um, my daughter <laughs> wouldn't have to go through this. And that's what it means to me. I want to make sure that um, the work has been archived by us, that is uh, from an emic perspective, that it comes from within the community as well, because there is no way for you to write about a Black woman if you are not a Black woman. You're going to write it from your perspective and within that is our biases, okay? Um, you don't know all the spaces um, there are. So that was one of the reasons why I created the, the space. Brilliant. So I'm gonna bring us uh, back together now. All right, we are here together. Um, so, we have like 12 questions in the Q&A right now. Um, but before we start to get into those, again, thanks to everyone who has entered a question into the Q&A. Something that I'm seeing um, across your work is this idea of representation beyond just the body. Um, and I wonder about your thought processes individually in terms of addressing that. Um, I think like we're seeing it in different ways present for you, uh, Latoya, we're seeing it in terms of you including the thoughts of your subjects into the work. In your case, Jennifer, it's moving beyond this traditional Western woodcut and using um, all of these different techniques to sort of create a full, a fuller picture and fuller image. Tanakia, we're seeing that in terms of the choices of you actually creating Black women in print to actually begin to archive and sort of um, build futures for Black women in print, as well as other elements of your individual practice. So I just wonder about what you think about that. <laughs> Anybody can take it first. Could you repeat the top um, portion of the question yeah. regards, regarding bodies? Sure. Representation beyond the body. So just in terms of um, what, what is pushing that? Obviously, you know, figurative work right now is hot. Everybody wants a black figurative art. Uh, but what is it for you? What is, what is your endeavor to do beyond that? Because I'm, I'm seeing it in all of your work. I lean. I personally lean into the text-based work. Um, so you can still talk about Blackness, um, the Black social life and Black interiority without using the Black body as well. Because if you want to take away the markedness of Blackness, then there's some way that you're going to have to either write it within scholarship or you're going to have to take the body out of it. Um, like Alma Thomas used, you know, the abstract, you know, art. I particularly use text-based um, when I want to talk about um, Blackness overall and not just Black womanhood. And you have to look at the different spaces, the in-between spaces in order to do that so that you can show that there are nuances there. Um, there's an expansion. It's not monolithic. 
And if you approach it without just looking at the black body as well, then all those biases have to go away. So for instance, with the in search of black woman, uh, in search of black hair, um, I used ephemeral, like material culture. Okay. Most of us understand material culture is part of our everyday lives. Um, you may have used a word search um, as a kid or somewhere else. So you're wait, approaching wait, it from that wait. perspective. Kind of here. For some reason, um, you're breaking up. So if you can like say everything you've said in the last 20 seconds or so again. <laughs> okay. I was saying that within In Search of Black Hair, I use the material culture piece, a word search. And from there, I was able to talk about Blackness from a Black interior um, space because I use those different words. I also underlaid um, words that were not known within that piece um, in between those subaltern words too. But anyone can approach that. If you are familiar with a word search, then you are going to lay down those biases of the Black body and approach it from your perspective and then you can actually gain a little bit more knowledge. So that's what I do with the text-based work. You're on mute, Latoya. You've muted yourself. Um, so I was saying with the pieces that you referenced from my work in particular, where I was um, interviewing the women, I think it's really important um, just to hear what our thoughts, thoughts are about ourselves. Because a lot of times everybody always tells us what but with women in particular, I feel like we are told how we need to exist and how we need to be, whether that's with people within our community. And then we also have people outside voices interpreting who we are for us, kind of like what you said, Tanikia, that it's hard. If you're not a Black woman, it's hard for you to properly articulate my experience. And you can, you can co have commentary as an outsider, but you really don't understand the nuances that happen. Because um, so a lot of the work that I deal with, I call it my work like universal and specific at the same time. It's universal enough that like everybody understands what the idea of a matriarch, but the lens of my role as a matriarch is specific to me. There are nuances that I experience as a black woman that you aren't gonna experience, even though you may also be a mother from another culture. We have the same connection that, yes, I'm a mother and I have children, but when you break down the everyday lives and you think about our experiences, whether that's you know the things that are passed down from generation to generation, my experience as a mother may have nuances that are different from your experience as a mother. So I feel like it's our, our duty to kind of say what those things are through our particular lens so that it's not misinterpreted interpreted. And I really enjoyed um, what you said, Tanika, about just people having Black scholarship about our work so that when we do present in museum shows, like what we have have said about ourselves is being recorded. You know, we're the only group of people where we've always been named by somebody else. You know, just, you know, think about we were colored and then we were this and then we were that. So now I feel like we're taking that upon ourselves. So I'm not going to let you tell me who I am. I'm going to show you who I am through my work and through what I've said about myself. And I think for me, um, I think I'm really interested in more of the space and how um, as African-Americans, as, as Black people, how we have to learn how to navigate within these different spaces in which where we live, where we work, um, where we might go to school, where we might go to be educated. And so then I conflict that a little bit with Japanese, traditional Japanese prints where it might be like, a lady drinking tea or they might be celebrating you know a favorite holiday or it might be something that's really like light-hearted but then I conflict that with like how we're trying to navigate ourselves as a black people and how we have continued to navigate through the toughest times and so I want to conflict those different ideas um, with traditional Japanese ideas as far as prints um, and then I want to conflict with contemporary today and then I also try to fuse in like the 1950s and 60s and like how this was like a you know, it's still a crazy, crazy time now. But even back then, like, you know, how that evolved over time until today. And so I try to look at like the past, I even go back to even the 40s and say, okay, what were people wearing back then? Like, what were some of the, what were some of the predicaments that they were in? And how did they navigate that space and live their daily lives? And so um, that's why I put in like the education component of the duck and cover. Um, but that was really after I researched more about the duck and cover drill, there's a whole commercial and he puts the duck and get down on the floor and, you know, the tongue bomb. And so like, basically, I wanted to think about how these drills have continue to repeat within our education systems today. And um, no matter how many drills you prepare for, um, you, you have to always be able to learn how to navigate in any situation. And so 
Um, that's why the female was wearing um, like, you know, like bullet shells and like guns and like, what do you need to navigate within that space? Because I've been in many spaces, whether you be at school and art school, you're the only African American in the whole class or the whole class of printmakers, you're the only one. Um, you're the only one within your school. You're the only one in a print shop and you're not supposed to be there. So all in all, like this is a really great group for me as a support group um, because I experienced a time when I was trying to print within a shared space and um, people were attacking me like, you're using the paper cutter wrong. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, it's a paper cutter. And so like, I vented my frustrations and I was able to, you know, talk about that in an email and then we just support each other, you know, as black women at print, print records because, you know, we're not supposed to be in certain spaces. That's what, that's what people think, but it's our job and my job to make sure that the people who I put within my prints, um, that they can take over any space and navigate. That's right, Jen. <laughs> Ooh, we have 16, whopping 16 questions now. Let's see um, if any of these sort of give us a nice flow into the next thing. Tanikia, can you take a moment and talk about our other members as well? Because some people have, I've seen in the question, like, do you know Delita Martin or do you know this person? So could you just take oh. a moment and talk about our other members as well? Yes, yes. So um, we do have Delita Mar Martin, basically our contemporary Elizabeth Catlett, <laughs> um, Latoya Hobbs, um, Jennifer um, Mac Watkins, Leslie Duguid of Duguid Press, Stephanie Santana, um, Angela Pilgrim um, as well. And I don't think I missed anybody. No, no. So those are all founding uh, members and basically what the founding members have um, helped do, they are basically laying a foundation for when we do have incoming members coming in, letting us know exactly like um, what people are interested in so that we can actually have some visibility for other black women and some con um, connecting um, relationships for. So they basically are an advisory um, board as well, um, giving us information for that. And then we are also working on board members and Delita Martin is one of our work as well. Awesome. Well, okay. You get Sorry, you kind of broke up at the end. I said I didn't know if any of their questions tell about each one of the women they were asking or wanted to know who the women were. <laughs> I'm just gonna say okay and ask some of these questions. Um, from Eddie M, have any of the sisters thought about any connections between printmaking's reproduction and care aspects as black women artists and their reproductive and nurturing roles as black women in family society? since many of them are mothers. And someone actually sent a question like that to me via email. So thank you for that, Eddie. I don't know if you all are comfortable with that question, but if you're not, feel free to not answer it. Could you say it again, just so I can make sure? Yep. Uh, yes. um, have any of the sisters thought about connections between printmakings, reproduction, and care aspects as Black women artists and their reproductive and nurturing roles as Black women in families and or society, since many of them are mothers. All of you are mothers, actually. Yeah, and I, I think it's, um, I was kind of just thinking about how I ended up in this role as a printmaker, because if you think what I talked about earlier, how every print process has a matrix. And if you think about the word matrix, it comes from the root word matriarch, which means matriarch or meaning to reproduce. Um, so I don't know, I just don't find it like coincidental that you know, I ended up being a printmaker, which the whole pro the whole point of that is like reproducing these images. Um, and I think about my work as that I, I'm nurturing um, my work, just like I nurture my children um, in the same sense. So that's for me, that's the kind of correlation, just the whole idea of um, printmaking being a process where the purpose is to reproduce and replenish and make more of. So I find like that's the role that I play um, as a mother in my family, just thinking about this idea of nurturing um, as the role that I play in terms of the advancement of our, our culture, because I feel like as a mother, um, we are the salt that preserves and kind of holds everything together, whether that whether we're out in the forefront or behind the scenes. And I feel like if we have like nurturing in our home, then that's going to create a strong family, strong families create strong neighborhoods, strong neighborhoods create strong communities. And then I think, you know, we'll see that kind of reciprocate in our culture as a whole. And I just wanted to follow up that 
for me, um, the nurturing is for self. And I think that that's one of the things that a lot of mothers um, have not, um, especially black mothers, they are seen to sacrifice to nurture um, themselves um, for their children. And I grew up, you know, with that same thing handed down to me. So the reproduction is not to reproduce some of the things that were passed down to me in regards to not taking care of self in order to take care of family. I realized that through printmaking um, that I'm cultivating a self-care relationship with myself so that I can actually be a better mother, so that I can be a better printmaker, so that I can be a better sister. Um, so I think that that has overall um, taking a stand for me so that I can care for my community by caring for myself. For me, um, I think as far as the nurturing component, um, basically I have a corner in my living room. So like, like I, when I'm working, I'm like, I'm fully here. I can still like have my hand on making sure the baby's okay. And I can like come over here and I can do some artwork and then I can come over and cook. And so basically the space, like what I'm, what I'm you know, like, what I always am saying about my work, space is really important because I have to learn how to navigate um, within this space of home and be able to combine and let, you know, this is mommy's space over, this is my space over here, but you're welcome to come over if I invite you. Um, sometimes I allow my, my daughter to just play around with like pins and markers to get used to like why this space is special. And so she can know that, you know, I'm a printmaker, but you know, this is something that mom, this is something that is really important to me. And sometimes I allow her to pick up a tool. Hey, this is a, what is this mom? You know, mommy, what is this? This is a barin. You use this to rub the paper. So like she has questions. And so being able to let her enter into this personal space, um, but it's a shared space. And so, um, I think as a printmaker, I definitely um, am showing a nurturing component. I could, I could do both. I could print and I can work within the space and take care of my family. And I think that's just an important, not, not aside from me being just a printmaker, but I think being an artist in general, I feel like it's really important um, for my children to be exposed to our practice. In my household, my husband and I are both artists. Um, and so my children now, like the things that I had to kind of wrestle with, like not knowing any black artists growing up or not having any um, art, black artists shown in my history classes, like they won't have to wait to try to get that from an educational system. They're already getting it in our home. Um, and I also feel like, you know, we've talked about like a lot of um, our academic institution, we were the only one. And I feel like a lot of that is just because of growing up for me, nobody ever saw art as a viable um, career. Right. So I did art in junior high and high school. And then when I got to college, I actually was like a biology major. So I was like, okay, let me put this art so aside so I can get a real job. But I feel like a lot of our younger people coming up, they're seeing people like Amy Sherrill, who, you know, has this amazing platform because she was able to do a portrait of Michelle, uh, Michelle Obama. They're seeing that, you know, art is a possible thing, something that I could actually do. Um, and my boys, they see this as something that they can do. Like they already call themselves artists. They call us, they say, you know, mom, we're an art of family. Everybody in our family does art. We're all artists. Um, and one particular story, like, you know, just thinking about the idea of legacy, um, I took my boys to see um, the generations exhibit that was here at the Baltimore Museum of Art, like at the end, like last winter. Um, when we were in the gallery, you know, talking and, you know, my boys, they ask questions, they talk about the, the art. Um, and so, there was an empty space next to a Sam Gilliam. And my five-year-old, he was like, mom, I'm gonna hang my artwork right there. And then you can go over there and there's an empty spot and you can put your work over there. So um, just the fact of them seeing us as artists engaged in our practice, it being all around them, they don't, they don't have, they won't have this idea of this is a space where I don't belong. Like at five years old, he already sees him as a, this is a space that I have access to, that I can be a part of. It's not something that I'm exclude, excluded from. So even if when he grows up, if somebody does try to tell him, he doesn't belong, that's not gonna be his truth because he can say, well, my mom was exhibiting and they took me to these shows and I know all these artists. So I think it's really up to us to instill these things in our, our young people. <laughs> um, not to, you know, be sound cliche, like, but the children oh, you're are right. People. You're 100% right. Yeah, and so, you know, we talk about, at least in our, what's been going on in our community, like we've been talking about revolution and how we can change things. And I really think it really, really, really starts in, in your home. I think it's great. Uh, to protest and we need that. But we also have to think about the day-to-day -day things that we need to do in our everyday lives, like taking ownership of our culture um, and how we, you know, pour that out into the world. For sure. Um, so I unmuted myself to say that 
uh, I've actually been thinking about how to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of something that I'm thinking of calling an opportunity fund, because I think, you know, there's so many barriers that exist in terms of, as you said, people who have not been exposed. And usually, you know, in this space, nothing is free. Everything costs money to do work. You need supplies, you need wood, you need ink, you need paint, et cetera. And, you know, for younger people, they don't have access to those things. They may not have a clear path in terms of thinking about, okay, well, this is what I need to do in order to be able to do this thing as a career. So what I've been thinking about, and there's a probably a, a few of you that are in um, as participants, but thinking about just what can we do so that I'm 34 right now, I, it took me, a few years to figure out how to be here, right? What if at 15, at 20, at 25, you already have that? The world is yours then, right? Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. So if you all want to talk about that, we can talk about that offline. And if anyone else um, that is joining as a participant wants to talk about that, we can talk about that. Um, and I think that last bit of what you said sort of lends to two different questions that are here. Um, I think this is prescient. Um, has the national civil rights movement impacted your thoughts as a creative? Mm. I love y'all. <laughs> I mean, I'm if I may, I'm going to answer that actually because I think we've already been saying this. Like, this is what we've been saying. This is why we do what we do because our lives matter because our art matters, because our voices are many and they have been consistently ignored in the canon. Um, and frankly, it's enough, you know? Um, if we wanna talk about the nature of just the beginning of, of everything in this country, you don't get any of that if we are not here. If we are not um, having our labor exploited, if we're not having our culture exploited. And I think, you know, that's what we've been saying all along, forever at this point. Um, and at this point, it sort of is not on us anymore because there's enough, there's more than enough evidence to support the claims that we've been making for centuries at this, st at this stage. Um, I hope that answers the question. Next one. Um, <laughs> some of these are specific uh, to some of your individual practice. Um, but I'll ask a question that's not first. Um, how do you print without a press? How difficult is it? From Karen Revis. Thanks everyone who has put a question here. Karen also has a second question. What type of wood do you use? So we'll kind of package those up. Um, I can, so I can, I can talk, tackle that first because I do a lot of um, printing here. Like a lot of the images that I showed you, the smaller prints are like 16 by 20. Like I, I print those right here on this table that my, <laughs> that my laptop is on. So are you pretty much, if you have like an ink and a surface and a block and like a spoon or something that you can rub and create pressure with, like you can create a print. Um, that's one of the things that I like about pr this woodcut process the most is that it's so immediate and I, I can do it anywhere and I don't have to have a lot of specialized equipment if I don't have access to it. And that's important for me also because I, my studio is in my basement at home. Um, so I need to be able to work here so I can like run upstairs and prep dinner and then run back down and like pull a couple prints or after the boys go to sleep, I can just easily come down to my studio and get to work. So really all you need is uh, um, some wood carving tools, some ink and a spoon and paper. <laughs> um, actually, and strong muscles. Yeah, yeah, a lot, <laughs> of, elbow, a lot of elbow grease. Printmaking is not for the faint at heart. Like you need some some arm strength if you're gonna be a printmaker. <laughs> um, and then somebody said the type of wood. Um, so in graduate school, like a lot of those large scale prints that you saw earlier in my presentation were done on MDF, which is micro density fiber. Um, it's good if you start now because it's inexpensive. You can get it from Home Depot. You don't have to like order it from somewhere special. The only drawback is that it is not resistant to water. So you know, you can't get them wet. I learned that the hard way from experience when my studio flooded and some of the blocks um, were swollen on one end. But now that um, I've upgraded, so I use like mahogany or like a cherry because uh, with the nature of my work, I do a lot of fine detail lines. So you want something that's a wood that's hard enough um, that's gonna hold a mark, but not too hard that it's hard to make the mark into the surface of the wood. 
And I think for me, um, as far as like printing without a press, something I had to learn um, with this new technique, you know, in grad school, you know, you, you have presses, you have the opportunity to learn about how to hand, print by hand, but with Jivens Window Block, there, you know, you can use press, there's people who are out there who are combining new techniques, but I try to keep some techniques traditional, and so I use a barin, and the barin is basically like a circle disc, and it's like bamboo leaf that's wrapped around, and then inside the barin, there are like leaves that are like stringed up bamboo and they're wrapped around in a coil and so you're basically rubbing in a circular motion and that's how I produce um, the Japanese wood blocks and um, the type of wood that I like to use is shinna it's a softer wood cherry wood is a lot harder to use it's more traditional um, but shinna and cherry both have to come and ex be exported from Japan and so I usually just get you know my blocks um, from Maclean's um, and that's like a local place within the states, and so basically, um, the wood has to be ex imported from from Japan. So, it's so very this is my this is my spoon. <laughs> so this is what I use to print with. Like, you know, I'm kind of I want to say cheap, but I'm frugal. So if I have something around that I can use, then I just try to use it. So this like this spoon has been with me for a while since like undergrad. So I basically just put here and then just rub, like if this is my wood block, I just rub over the surface to transfer the image. And this is a barin. So they have metal with metal balls. This is the bamboo and it looks like this and you hold it like this. And then this is a plastic one. So you have different strengths, different types of barins for different uh, like, you know, images. And so there's three different kinds and there's people who make it out of purely like just things that they have found, but that's what I use for my barins for hand printing. Tana Um, I don't use wood. I do lino um, for relief and um, letterpress. Letterpress, you have to have a machine um, for linoleum. I use a barin as well. I have a wood one and I also have a glass one, which I can grab and show. <laughs> I love our printmaker show and tell. <laughs> no, but it's needed. It's so needed. And I appreciate all of you for being willing to have this conversation today. Um, for any artist who wishes to answer, do you have a regular schedule for art making or do you fit it in between your other responsibilities? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so I, I think all of us, we wear many hats, like all of us are mothers, we're um, in academia as, in, as educators, and we're um, also, you know, practicing artists. So um, it's just whenever I can, <laughs> whenever I can get it in. Um, so the, the good thing is that I have the support of my husband, who is also an artist. So we just kind of uh, tag team. So at any given night after the boys go to bed, generally I work from like nine to like three, if I have, you know, things going on. Um, in the summer, I can do that more just because I'm not teaching, but during the school year, I try to, my studio time mainly happens on the weekends or unless I have a deadline for something. But if, you know, if I have like a couple shows coming up or a big deadline, then my husband is really flexible. Um, so he'll say, you know, I'll take these certain days in the weekend, I can work in the daytime and at night, or he'll, you know, take the boys out so I can have time um, to work in peace but most of the time it's just really around my schedule um it, it changes like versus the semester versus the summertime um but generally like on average i my studio time is generally like around nine from nine to two or nine to three um but i try to i've limited myself to like not stay up past two on um, you know if i have a deadline just because um i homeschool my children as well uh, before corona um, so I want to make sure that I'm not like tired and cranky because then like our lessons just don't go well because I'm like half tired and taking the fact that I'm tired and frustrated out on them. So I really, for the sake of my family and my boys, just to make sure I'm, that I'm able to be uh, kind to them, I try to not to stay up too late. And that, that also kind of goes into our self-care and not feeling like um, you have to, so I have a lot of pressure on myself. Um, and somebody said, when do I sleep? So this, so I've been doing this just because I have a big deadline coming up. Um, so I kind of need to get these things up, but that's not, I don't do that all the time because that's not sustainable. 
Um, and if I do have a deadline coming up and I have to work a lot, then I try not to stay up late, like more than two or three nights in a row. So. I'm, I'm like Latoya too, um, a mom. So my schedule kind of depends on how my children are acting, I should say. <laughs> so I, it's better when they're asleep because I can consistently work without um, any interruptions. That's the way that I like to work. I like to have my music on and just to zone out to do the work. And typically that means um, I can work from 10 until, you know, well, it depends on how much I'm in the zone. Sometimes I'll go 10 to five. If not, I'll go to sleep when they go to sleep because I'm really tired. Then I'll wake up um, either in the morning or five in the morning and I'll work until they get up. So it just kind of, um, and if they're with their grandparents, I can work all the time, so. Use your grandparents, the grandparents too. <laughs> and this is the Baron um, that I use. It's a glass one. I think it's called a frog or something, like the print frog, I think. And I think for me, like, um, I think, like, it depends on if I'm in school. Like, right now, we're, we're doing homeschooling and I've been teaching online. And so, if we're thinking, like, prior to, you know, um, Corona. Um, so basically I would like get my day started, wake up about 5.30, drive about an hour to get to school, work at school all day, come home, cook dinner, get everybody taken care of. Oh. And usually I um, don't get to art until after everybody's at, is, is asleep. Um, now with the homeschool situation, um, the whole day is pretty much all about taking care of the, the little ones and getting them started with their, with their lessons and giving food and lunch and cooking. And then usually when a nap happens, then I go in and just start working. And then again, later on at night when they're sleeping for a longer period of time. So sleeping is a really um, good way to get work done when you have children, when, when they're taking naps. Awesome. Thank you, Alma LaVon Rice for that question. Um, there's another really great question um, that's posed to all of you that I love. Dion Thornton has asked, how do you deal with issues of sustainability and recycling or upcycling for the wood that you're using? Um, also space saving and all, and I'm sorry, space and saving all your plates. How do you optimize your storage spaces as printmakers? Well, when I was in graduate school, um, I would work on both sides of my blocks to save space. Um, yeah, so I, I, I didn't notice any like difference in the quality of printing. So instead of having like a pile of blocks, I would have one image on one side printed and then work and then do another print uh, image on the other side. Um, and so also, that's kind of why I'm, I'm working on the panels and presenting my panels as paintings. Um, for me, it, it cuts down with presentation costs, right? Because, you know, if you do a traditional print, then you have to, if you're going to present it like in a museum space, you want it to pre present nicely um, and have, you know, the proper museum quality framing. Well, for those large prints, um, those can be anywhere from like 500 to $800 to print. So another reason I shifted to working on the panels was just to cut down on my overhead cost in terms of presentation and also just my cost in general um there's a lot of things like the same papers that i use to put make prints from is the same paper that i use to collage into my blocks uh my panels um and then saving space is like i don't know if you guys can see my studio like over there but i have a lot of my blocks kind of stored and tucked away and they are flat so they're easy kind of to store um easily but um with the work that i'm doing now the mixed media pieces like the block is the painting so that's going to be out in the show or if somebody buys it so i don't necessarily have to worry about storage in that regard um for me with storage i'm a painter as well as ella toy is, is too as well as a printmaker so that means supplies so i kind of like use the ikea alex um, system. Um, so I put papers and different things in there. I use rolling carts to store um, paper because I try vertical space as much as possible um, for that. And um, I'm in the Midwest. So we have a little bit more extra space for anybody that, you know, the one who's like on the East Coast. So I can have um, work downstairs um, in the basement storage area, you know, as well. So um, storage really isn't a problem because of geographical location for me, I should say. 
And I think for me, like similar to Latoya, I, I use both sides of the block. So I like, okay, this, this side is, I could use this side, I could use this side. Um, and I also store it just like kind of like in the corner. Um, but then I really like to also keep the blocks because I like to study them and like see, you know, what did I do differently? What can I do differently? What was working here? What wasn't working? And just being able to study the, uh, the wood that I carved prior and for um, later, for later, for later prints. And also like I like to use them for demonstrations of wood and um, demonstrations and workshops. So I don't throw them away. I keep them, I study them and um, I, Hopefully, I can store everything within this space. If not, I just put it in the, in the, in the closet, but I don't throw them away. I keep them. Yeah, and I was also going to say that a lot of um, like galleries and museums are becoming more interested in thinking about the blocks as an art object itself. Uh, so, you know, in the future, I could, and I, I mean, I think I, I was in conversation with somebody and they asked about that. So, um, yeah, so I could actually, you know, present my blocks as finished pieces, um, which I'm doing now in the same sense, but they're paintings, but I also thinking about like estate planning. So all of my blocks, um, like my new work now that I'm presenting the blocks as paintings, like those will be sold, but anything that I carved as a block that was intended to be a print that I'm printing an edition from, like those will never be sold. Those will be saved from my estate. So like, you know, after I blow all the way up and my children need some money, they be like, Leah, let's just pull the print from mama's block and we can sell it. <laughs> So all of my blocks, you know, regardless of how many they are, I, I plan on like keeping those um, to for my family. Fantastic. Um, so this was posed to Jennifer, but I feel like this is something that all of you can answer because you are all actively working as educators. Uh, Santi Butler has asked, how has being an educator as well as uh, dedication to teaching influenced and strengthened the works of your most recent projects? I think I'll go, Santi. Thank you for that question. Uh, so I think like I just started doing children recently. Before it was just like women, and so I was like, okay, well, if I'm teaching and I'm always constantly having to think about education and my role as a teacher, um, I started to uh, put in uh, works that have children in them slowly, and so um, and also like I try to put in usually like an adult, you know, is there to like you know, hey, this is how you navigate the space in case you feel unsafe. Like, what do you do when you feel unsafe, right? You do you duck and cover, do you run, do you, um, do you grab a weapon? Like, you know, like these are all things I, I wanted to kind of add into the spaces that I create within some of my prints. Um, and I'm more, I'm more interested in like the action of like the, that need for protection and what does that look like in different spaces? Um, and so like, that's how I really influenced um, that's how I really been able to like think about my work as an educator and it's really influenced work that I create. Yeah, um, as an educator, it's, so it's, it's influenced my work more from a technical aspect. Um, so I first started my teaching journey. Um, well, let me just say, I feel like I'm a teacher at heart, whether I'm going to be in an academic institution or not, like in every type of activity that I did, I always ended up teaching in some capacity, like in high school, I danced and I was a lieutenant that taught everybody the routine or, um, you know, at other jobs that I had, I was the training person teaching people stuff. So I think teaching is going to be, um, just a part of my role, just being able to explain and give information to people. But when I started teaching art, it really helped me in my own practice. Um, just because like you have to strengthen yourself and your knowledge base to teach people who don't even sometimes feel like they want to know what it is that you're teaching. So how can I teach this information to you effectively um, in a way? So I had to like really think about how to explain like how to make this drawing or how to make your drawing look more realistic or just thinking about being clear in the delivery of information. That's, that's helped me when I'm presenting my own work, just not um, assuming that people understand stuff just because you think they're in a certain space. So it's helped me have more clarity with my presentation and how I talk about my work, but it's also helped me um, technically because, you know, explaining to someone else how to draw just helps me to understand how I draw better. Um, and then also I teach at Maryland Institute College of Art um, and we have a some amazing students. Um, so I feel like as an educator, I, I'm open in the fact that I don't feel like I'm the only person who can be learned from. I feel like I learn a lot from my students um, as well. So just being in an environment where you're around really talented students, um, I, I was like, hey, like when I was, you know, your age, I wasn't doing work this strong. So it kind of, you know, just pushes me in my own practice as well. I'm 
sorry, I didn't hear the question because it was like the fuzziness, so <laughs> the noise. So I didn't hear the question, but it seems like it was something about art educators. Yeah, I got you. So the question is, how has being an educator as well as dedication to teaching influence and strengthen the works of your most recent projects? Oh, well, well I teach my um, students that um, basically lived experiences is valid knowledge. So taking in their lived experience, their personal, and bringing it into their work um, and bringing it into dialogue in general about whatever topics they're thinking about uh, actually helps. Um, that's what I do because you have to, I really push the emic perspective so, so much because in order for us to dismantle master narrative, there has to be a counter narrative and it has to be in um, written and spoken and visually created from that person. So that's pretty much what has helped my practice. I try to do that too, but I also sit with my work. It makes me sit with my work a lot more. Feel like um, within the art field, um, it's a lot of rush to get your work out. Um, whereas if you're like a musician, you can actually create something and sit with it. You can hide it in the desk or whatever. Um, we have a responsibility for what we put out there. And the more you, I guess, sit with your work, um, understand your work, then it should be able to help you um, get it out there for your students as well as for yourself. Awesome. So this is going to be the last question because we are pushing up on 2.30. Um, as printmakers, this question is from Art Ar Ariston. Ariston, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name. As printmakers, where do you see the future? I'm not, I can't read. I'm sorry. Let's start over. Okay. As printmakers, where do you see the art of printmaking and creating the print well into the future? So if I understand this question correctly, he's asking about, or they are asking about the future of printmaking as all of you see it. Let me know if that's wrong or correct or right in the chat, please, Art. Well, I can, I can take it first. I think um, for me, it follows along with the same thing with, with, with other art practices. I feel like a lot of um, artists are kind of making up their own rules and uh, kind of pushing the boundaries of uh, not only subject matter, but also materials. Um, and I feel like printmaking has done the same thing. There, there's a lot of um, printmakers doing really exceptional work that kind of pushes the idea of number one, what is considered a print, right? Um, and also just the mixing and mingling of different um, processes. Um, when The first time that I went to uh, the MAPC conference, um, it was basically a conference of like printmakers where printmakers come together. Like I saw a lot of like wonderful things happening. So all of our processes are pretty much kind of centered around relief. Um, but there's other like there's intaglio, there's lithography, there's mezzotint, there's screen printing, um, there's risograph. Um, there's a lot of different processes and a lot of people are doing great things. Like I've seen like three dimensional prints. Like I've been in print exchanges where people like one of the prints was like a dollhouse, right? So they printed all these dollhouses and then you could fold it and make a three-dimensional like art object from it. I've had like scratch and peel prints where, you know, you scratch off the top of the print and then there's another image underneath. So um, there's a lot of innovation happening with printmaking, but I think, again, it's really just exposure because a lot of people really, again, are unaware of what printmaking is. So, um, but if you do your research, you'll see a lot of like really, exciting and great things happening with printmaking. I think the future for printmaking would probably re really involve like, I guess the ability to be able to adapt to like uh, the space that you are working in, where you live, your environment. And so I feel like it's gonna take a turn. Like maybe we're gonna start using technology even more and maybe incorporating traditional practices with, um, uh, with like, you know, the future of printmaking, right? And so maybe it looks like um, we're going to be using more recyclable objects. Maybe it's going to look like there's more than one way to make a, a print in your home. There's more, one, there's more, there's more than one way to use this, this like gum Arabic to make this type of reaction that you're looking for. And so I feel like it's just going to continue to evolve. And I think it's going to be more uh, community coming together and sharing practices, whether it be at conferences, whether it be like in the classroom, whether it be like in a local print shop. So I think the continuation of exchange is going to even become even um, even stronger. I look at the um, future of printmaking 
really as offering more counter narratives into the work. That's what I really want to see um, so that it does not belong to one group of people. That is my biggest um, wish for the future of printmaking as well as um, combining hybrid practices um, with it, just like what Latoya and Jen Burr were talking about. Um, as a painter, I'd love to make sure that I can infuse my painting uh, within printmaking more as well. So those are the things that I really, really want to see. Wonderful. Well, um, it's exactly 2.30 now. Um, thank each of you so much for your time, for your insights, for sharing your experience, for sharing. Actually, I think, you know, when you, when you allow something that you desire to come out of your mouth, it makes it a real thing. So I'm glad to actually have ended on that um, as our final thoughts that each of you shared. Again, thank everyone for staying around. There's still 84 of you with us. I appreciate it a great deal. Um, tune in next week for the next 4-4, always on Saturday, always at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, again, just thank you, the three of you again, for everything that you shared with us today. Um, hopefully we have inspired and we have educated. Have a great weekend, everybody.